Now that we have our atomic units for our molecular Hamiltonian, we quickly encounter a problem. And that problem is that the Schrodinger equation for an arbitrary molecule can't be solved. Or rather I should say can't be solved exactly with a finite amount of computing resources and a finite amount of time. So for all of our purposes, we can't solve the Schrodinger equation exactly for anything other than a hydrogen atom. And the reason this is, is because we have n charged particles. So a typical atom is composed of a bunch of nuclei, and a or typical molecule or molecular system is composed of a bunch of nuclei and a bunch of electrons. So we have a bunch of charged particles there, and if we have n total charged particles, we'd have n choose 2, or n times n minus 1 over 2, interacting pairs. So there's a quadratic number of those. Uh, n squared over 2 minus n over 2. And this is what is known in physics as the many body problem. And the many body problem is typically unsolvable for any number of particles which is greater than 2. You can solve it exactly for two particles, which is why we can do it for a hydrogen atom containing one electron and one nucleus, but we can't solve it exactly for any molecular system which has more than two charged particles, which rules out pretty much every interesting uh, system that we can think of. So in, uh, in computational terms, or in computer science terms, this is what you would call an NP-complete problem. And if you use this uh, asymptotic complexity notation, you notice that the difficulty of solving such a problem scales as an exponential in the number of particles. So it actually gets exponentially more difficult to solve this problem as the number of particles increases. So it's not twice as difficult to solve the problem if you go from 10 to 20 particles. It's you know e to the 20 more difficult uh, than, than it is with 10. All right, and we have to solve this, so this is where we have to start introducing approximations in order to be able to get a handle on the molecular Hamiltonian and try to get out some approximate solutions which will eventually end up at Hartree-Fock theory. So the first thing we notice is that the mass of the nuclei is much, much greater than the mass of an electron. So as I noted in the previous video, a hydrogen nucleus weighs about 2,000 times more than an electron. And most nuclei contain more than just one particle. For example, a carbon atom would have 12. A carbon 12 would be 12. Um, you know, what, whatever other nuclei there are, whatever their atomic, whatever their mass number is, that's going to be, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of times greater than that electron mass. So what this is going to mean is that because of that very high mass, that our nuclei are going to move very slow relative to our electrons. So the set of nuclei is going to move slow relative to the set of all electrons. So what we're going to do is approximate that the positions of all of the nuclei are fixed relative to the electrons. So this means that we're going to treat the kinetic energy of the nuclei as being zero because they can't have kinetic energy if they're not going anywhere. If they're fixed, they can't move, no motion, no kinetic energy. So this is essentially equivalent to treating the nuclei as classical point particles. Classical in the sense that they do not have quantum behavior. We're going to pretty much concern ourselves with them as just charged particles that exist somewhere in space and then not be concerned much about their wave functions in the vast majority of applications in uh, quantum chemistry. All right, so uh, there was just some diagrams where I was showing there where our interaction of the charged particles, if there is zero, you have no pairs of interactions. Uh, two of them, you have one pair. Three of them, you have three pairs. Four, you have six. Five, you have 10, as predicted by this. Uh, n choose 2 formula. All right, so how does this approximation called the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, first used by those two scientists, uh, what does that do when we apply it to our molecular Hamiltonian? So the first thing to note is that our nuclear kinetic energy goes to zero. Because as I mentioned, they're all fixed, so the Laplacian of them is going to be zero at all points because they're not moving. So that goes to zero. 
Additionally, we have our nuclear-nuclear uh, repulsion term. Now, instead of being spread out over all space where the wave functions of nuclei might exist, um, the nuclei is just a particle which has a specific location in space. And so are all the others. So that means that RAB is going to be a constant, So every, as is ZA and ZB. So every term in this pairwise sum between all pairs of nuclei is going to be constant. So that means our uh, nuclear repulsion energy is going to be a constant as well. And for the rest of the terms we have, electron kinetic energy, electron nuclear attraction, electron electron repulsion, uh, these are still difficult. And as of yet, uh, we still haven't discussed the way that we can go about solving those. So in light of this approximation, we can now separate our calculations into what we call an electronic Hamiltonian and obtain an electronic wave function. So we're only concerned with the wave functions typically of electrons. So our electro electronic Hamiltonian acting on our electronic wave function gives us our electronic energy times our electronic wave function, the eigenfunction uh, there. Right, and then just for good measure, indicating what our electronic Hamiltonian is, uh, sum over all electrons of their kinetic energy, one half del squared i, Laplacian operator, minus its attraction, so it's a negative sign, sum over all electron nuclear pairs, charge of the nucleus divided by the distance between the electron and the nucleus, and then plus, because it's a repulsion term, plus sum over all pairs of electrons of one over their distance apart, the magnitude in which electrons repel one another. So that last term there, our constant but non-zero nuclear nuclear repulsion term, that's going to end up being a constant, so we can add it or not to our electronic energy should we choose. I believe in some of the videos in the quantum chemistry playlist, I do include this term in the electronic Hamiltonian. Uh, but since we're going in some more depth here, I think I'm typically not including it in the electronic energy uh, in this video, or in this chapter. So um, since it's a constant, we can do whatever we want with it. It is only going to affect our total energy, and it is not going to affect whatever our electronic wave function is. So the nuclear uh, positions determine what that energy is, and it's going to be a shift upward or well, it's positive, so it's always going to be up, but it's going to be some shift up in the energy, but not changing actually the shape or function of what those orbitals look like.